in the preliminary, we've each decided uh, that we're going to try to convert the other. Uh, uh, David is going to try to convert me to Chicagoism. I'm going to try to convert him to Austrianism. Uh, I failed with my uh, teacher, Gary Becker. He was my thesis advisor. Uh, I'm sure David will have no objection to me carrying, accounting Gary Becker as a Chicagoan, even though at the time he was at Columbia, because there are many universities of Chicago, as I'm sure David again will agree. There's the University of Chicago in Los Angeles, UCLA. There's the University of Chicago in New York, namely Columbia, when Gary Becker was there. Not so much nowadays, but in those days. And um, my critique will be of Chicagoites wherever they are, not necessarily of Chicago, and I'm sure David will not object to that. Okay, so let me tell you my story with Gary Becker. I was writing my uh, PhD on rent control, and he was my thesis advisor. And um, um, my thesis was that rent control screws up housing. It creates, I don't know, um, uh, shortages and lousy housing. And I did an econometric analysis where my main independent variable was numbers of years of rent control. New York City still had it, other cities didn't. And I try to control for everything else I could think of under the sun, namely uh, wealth or uh, weather or uh, north-south dummy variable, or every, anything I could throw, any, any kitchen sink I could throw in there in order to hold everything else constant. And most of the times I did pretty well. I, I got the right signs, namely the more rent control, the lousier housing in various ways. And um, usually it was statistically significant, but every once in a while I got the wrong sign. And embarrassingly, every once in a while the wrong sign was statistically significant. And I would uh, show this to Gary and uh, Gary was a nice guy. What, he, what I thought he really meant was, was um, block you moron, go out again and do it till you get it right. What he said was, uh, Walter, go out and do it again until you get it right. So what was testing what? And I was trying to convert him to Austrianism by saying, look, we know what's right about rent control. And, and this uh, econometric regression, uh, it, what's testing what is, is the opposite way around. Uh, namely, uh, the uh, theory is testing my econometrics, which uh, sometimes was OK and sometimes, sometimes was not. And yet this is the very opposite of the logical positivist view, where you're supposed to be testing theory. And um, I, I tried my best to convert him out of it and uh, I didn't succeed. But um, uh, I, I maintain that what's going on here when we test the minimum wage is, uh, or, or test free trade or test anything uh, of which we have uh, theories on. We don't have any theories about um, uh, what the elasticity of bananas is. And that's a purely empirical thing. And there's no, uh, the only way to find that out is to do an empirical test. But we have theories about uh, rent control, minimum wage, free trade, other things like that. And what's testing what is not the econometrics testing the theory, it's just illustrating it. And sometimes uh, as in Card and Kruger with their um, crappy stuff on minimum wage, uh, I think the, the illustration was wrong, but it's always an illustration, it's never a test. Okay, I now wanna talk about praxeology and I'm gonna to have to share a screen here. So let me pull up the screen. I'm gonna clear all the drawings and what we've got here is um, analytic, analytic, and we have a synthetic. And we have over here a priori and a posteriori. And that gives us four boxes. And what we have now is, uh, this would be a tautology. If it's, uh, by the way, analytic and synthetic are a logical or empirical status of a sentence. Whereas a priori and a posteriori is how do we get there? And we get there uh, either by thinking in, in this case or by um, uh, examining reality, looking at reality. And uh, over here we have a tautology. Uh, all bachelors are uh, unmarried men, uh, elephants are big uh, gray animals, things like that. Uh, these are analytic uh, uh, based on, on the uh, status and uh, they're a priori based on how we know them. They're absolutely necessarily true but they don't tell us about the real world. They only tell us about um, uh, how we're using words. Synthetic would be praxeology. Um, uh, a pri a synthetic a priori would be praxeology. And I, I say that these are necessarily true. 
and uh, also do talk about reality. This uh, area, there's no such thing here, and this would be empirical stuff. It's raining outside. Uh, and if you're gonna find out if it's raining outside, you have to look outside and, and test it. So these are the four things, and I'm sure David will agree with me that there are tautologies, and I'm sure he'll agree with me that there are empirical statements which we have to test. Where David and I, I think, part company is, uh, I think there is such a thing as a synthetic a priori, and I think he thinks that there's no such thing as a synthetic a priori. So again, what is a synthetic a priori statement? A synthetic a priori statement is something that is absolutely necessarily true. A predicted cannot be denied. To deny it is to commit a logical contradiction. And yet it tells us something about reality. And for David, who is a uh, logical positivist, uh, along with most economists, uh, he would say, there ain't no such thing here. This, yes, this, yes, but uh, David would put a cross there if, if, uh, if I read him correctly. Okay, let me get out of this and let me talk about some examples. And, and remember, there are three things, tautologies, empirical statements, and um, uh, synthetic a priori. Now, not all Austrians agree with this. I'm sort of channeling um, uh, Mises and Rothbard here, not Hayek. Hayek did not go along with this. So let me give some cases. Whenever two people, A and B, engage in a voluntary exchange, they both expect to profit from it, otherwise they wouldn't do it. And they have a reverse preference order for the goods and services exchanged so that A values what he receives from B more highly than what he gives to him, and B must evaluate the same things the other way around. Whenever voluntary trade occurs, both parties intend to improve their economic welfare. Both parties necessarily do at least ex ante. I'm now going to buy David's uh, uh, shirt, the University of Chicago shirt, and I'm going to pay him 50 bucks for it. And let's say David agrees to sell me his shirt. Well, this must mean that I value. Uh... I really didn't want to stop uh, during his opening statement, but uh, the he really likes these shirt examples. Uh, in the uh, in the debate with me, he I was wearing that like Michigan State University hooded I wear sometimes. And and he used multiple examples about taking my shirt and you know and 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 if you know if I got that shirt I took that shirt and it seemed like slightly strange but uh, so it's just kind of funny to see him use this again. Um, man, based on what I've heard about the difference so far, I've, I've got to say uh, Chicago seems less crazy. Yeah, well, he's doing he's doing this classical thing. So one of the reasons I wanted to do this debate with you um, is I have been arguing off and on with ANCAP since like 2014. Like mm -hmm. when OWS finally completely petered out, I was like, well, what am I going to do with myself now? Oh, anar <laughs> fake anarchists. <laughs> and, uh, you know, as I did it so long, I fought the final boss, uh, David D. Friedman. But like, this is just like a classic uh, thing where they... Uh, he, he was trying to get around it, but he was saying that like essentially economics are too complicated to be studied empirically, and therefore we need this uh, praxeology. If anybody's wondering what praxeology is, it's sort of their equivalent of uh, dialectical materialism, but it's like the Kmart dialectical materialism, and it's idealistic as opposed to uh, empirical. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I I kind of think it's similar to what some people mean by dialectical materialism and that's not an analogy that makes me feel more warmly towards uh <laughs> dialectical materialism at least in the sense that they mean um actually yeah I, I think there's definitely something there because like you know you could understand you know marx's you know materialist theory of history in a way where like what ga cohen does in his book Karl marx's theory of history where you know you sort of spend you know, hundreds of pages kind of like disambiguating it, like, okay, here are three things this might mean, you know, this is the one that seems most plausible. Can we make an argument for it? Do we need to revise it? Right. You know, and, and I think you get, you know, there, there, are, there are problems and there are legitimate criticisms or whatever, you know, but like, I, I think you're like within the sphere of, you know, I, I think there's a version of that that's defensible, but like dialectical materialism, as met by people who really love that phrase is like, mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, it really is like this. It's like, you know, here are some like first principles about how all of reality work 
that like yeah just and work from to, there <laughs> yeah just happened to coincide with like you know what like a couple, you know, what some 19th century philosophers thought, which is an amazing coincidence that that's like, that's all of reality conforms mm-hmm. to that, right? You know, that like uh, <laughs> conforms to the thoughts of, yeah, 19th century <laughs> philosophers. Oh, yeah, it's, yeah. So I did want to bring something up, by the way, while we're stopped. This is a very, very minor point, but uh, like the MS paint drawing did him no favors <laughs> at the beginning of this. I, I want to focus on the argument, but like, if you're going to be in a debate and you want to show something from your screen, get, do some PowerPoint, get it arranged ahead of time. Don't, I think some, one of our, one of our commenters were like, well, what are those like predator language scribbles? <laughs> so just, you know, presentation is, is quite important if, if you're trying to persuade someone through debates. So, so put a little more effort into persuasion or yeah, into persuasion there uh, and presentation, Walter. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, like, I, in a weird way, I found it almost charming. Although, although also, um, yeah, the like the lines were looked a little odd. But the uh, but I, I mean, if if nothing, you know, if nothing else, I mean, I've, I've I've drawn that exact four box thing enough time on times on whiteboards. It's like, oh yeah, there's that thing. You know, I mean, I haven't put praxeology <laughs> in it, uh, but uh, but yeah, he's getting that. As somebody pointed out in the comments, this is uh, Kant's uh, distinction. Uh, so you know, so Kant, uh, you know, makes these two distinctions: two distinctions, a priori and a posteriori, which are distinctions about knowledge. So uh, knowing something a priori means that you know it just by thinking about it, and knowing something a posteriori means that you know you you know it by like checking out in the world to see if it's true. And uh, so, roughly everybody. I mean, not Quine, but, you know, whatever, like in, in, you know, sort of history of philosophy, you know, Kant to Quine, you know, roughly everybody uh, thinks that there's, there are analytic truths that you can know a priori. So um, like, you know, all, uh, all bachelors are unmarried is, Mm -hmm. is an analytic truth, meaning that it's, it's true just um, it's made true just by like the definitions of the words, you know, mm-hmm. which is uh, so that's what analytic means. And a priori means that you can find out that that's true just by like logic chopping the definitions. You don't need to go out into the world and like do a study where you, where you <laughs> talk to all the bachelors and see if they're married or not. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, you, you like, you don't have to check because it's, it's, because it's made true just by the meanings of the words and logic. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. Yeah. which I will point out though, um, as far as like the, the, you know, obviously yes, uh, all bachelors are married, but you notice that that argument relies upon two, like the, the, the mental concept and legal concept of marriage. So you can know something about like human society a priori, but I don't know if you could necessarily know anything about the, like the actual material world a priori. Well, I mean, you can't even know it. I mean, you can't even know the claim about human society a priori. In other words, like, you know, you know that all bachelors are unmarried, but you know, you, you don't know that there are, you don't know if marriage exists. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) You know, to find out that marriage exists, that's a, that's a claim about the world. You have to go out and check Mm -hmm. like, you know, but just like, yeah. If anybody anywhere, you know, like if there is such a thing as marriage and, and, and there are, you know, adult males who aren't participating in it, then, you know, then, then, then they, obviously then they're not participating in it. Right. You know, that, mm-hmm. that's like, and we uh, attach this label to them and then therefore, you know, this label means that. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, it, it doesn't like, you know, but part of the point about these being analytic truths is that if like, whatever the, uh, the, um, what's the thing that Cambrian, like, whatever, if like there, there was some like evolutionary other turn and neither humans nor any other conscious creatures had ever come into existence, it would nevertheless be true. Nobody would know it, but it'd be true that all bachelors, you know, are <laughs> unmarried because it's, because that's a completely vacuate, like, you know, that's yeah. just a, that's just a claim about how, um, how the status of being a bachelor relates to, to the status of being married Mm-hmm. But like, that's just like saying like, or like everything that's, you know, uh, everything that there are, you know, three of, there's more than two of, 
and you know even in a world where there were only two things you know that that would that would still that would still be true right so that's mm -hmm. so those are definitely things you can figure out a priori everybody agrees on that like like walter said um the much more interesting and, and contested claim is the synthetic a priori that there are things that you can know um there are mm -hmm. things that are like meaningful claims about reality right mm -hmm. that they that uh there are things you could figure out just by thinking about them without going out and checking that actually tell you something about how reality is so like a classic version of that would be like if you read like Descartes, like and he'll or you know whatever various people like that, right? They'll make arguments for the existence of God that are just purely based on thinking about it. You know that uh, that they don't appeal to any empirical facts. Like the ontological argument for the existence of God is like the ultimate, mm -hmm. you know, um, synthetic a priori claim, right? You know that like you could that like you could just from thinking hard enough about it, you can figure out that there's a God. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, the same way that that's obviously bullshit, then uh, the, uh, so, so is so is this that he's talking about, <laughs> right? <You> know, the... <laughs> Spoiler, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> because, oh. of course, you know, it's, uh, you know, whether or not rent control you know, has the consequences that he says it is, it's an empirical question, you know, you, you can't, uh, you know, of course you can't solve that a priori. That's insane. Like that's, uh, <laughs> I, I mean, like what you, what you end up doing when you try to do this, like praxeology, it's like, oh, this is the a priori logical science of human action is you end up coming up with vaguely plausible sounding claims about how people act. Mm-hmm. And even those claims, I mean, there, there is a hidden appeal to empirical evidence, right? I mean, you only believe them because they conform in some way to some experience, you know, like what yeah. you've kind of gleaned from experience and observation. But, um, but like, yeah, and, it, and the, the trick is, and I mean, this is the problem, too, with a lot of the, you know, like the sort of internet Marxist, you know, dialectical materialism as a theory of life, the universe, and everything stuff that's like, yeah, it's not hard to come up with generalizations that sound plausibly plausible. true. Yeah, sure. It's like, yeah, that could be right. You know, that that sounds kind of right, you know. Mm -hmm. But it's like it's not hard to come up with incompatible things that both sound kind of right. And mm -hmm. you know, actual reality being incredibly complicated, you know, like like which ones of these is going to be relevant to describing anything that like is actually tells you what's going to happen in history in the you know materials case or like you know how rent control is gonna lay out right in this in this case uh yeah. is I, I mean, having just, lived in harlem for 10 years i know how uh rent control uh played out um and it was completely overwhelmed by bloomberg turning new york into a playground for billionaires to hide assets <laughs> yeah no exactly like it's i i, I mean just if i mean like I mean, forget morality, forget politics for a second. I mean, just 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 in terms of like how reality and especially how human behavior works, I think we should all kind of get that it's. I, you know, I don't want to do the thing that like <laughs> certain YouTube streamers I could mention do, where they, you know, it's, it's you know it's incredibly complicated, right? You know, but like it is really complicated, and uh, and like. <laughs> People act <laughs> on all sorts of motives in in ways that interact with like all kinds of like you know there there are there are a bunch of different factors that that lead to things happening or not happening when large groups of people interact with each other in complicated ways, and the idea that you could come up with like here are my you know my ten first principles of praxeology and then like all I have to do is deduce. You know, from, well, from all of these, yeah. You know. Well, yeah. And, well, and even like, so I don't want to get do that thing where like we, instead of critiquing the debate, we try to have a debate with the people that can't answer us. But, yeah. um, you know, like just, just to, before we move on, like just a great example, like the, um, so the action axiom, like the, the thing that praxeology is based on the first axiom is uh rothbard uh does it he defines it essentially as the primordial fact that mankind acts um 
purposefully as opposed to reflexively. Um, and, you know, you, you listen to that, you think it, it makes sense to, you know, your, it's a very intuitive argument that you can listen to it, think about it and be like, oh yeah, that seems true. But if you actually pay attention to it and what you realize very quickly is that the distinction between, um, uh, between purposeful action and purposeless action is an entirely subjective distinction. Be whereas Rothbard has accidentally uh, began thinking of uh, essentially like purpose as a feature of objective reality, as opposed to, you know, just something in his mind. So ultimately what Rothbard's saying at the very first axiom is mankind acts in a way that I personally think is purposeful. Which, yeah, okay, sure, but you, what what exactly have you said with that? Well, and it's also weird because it's like, I mean, the obvious interpretation of people act purposefully, like, would just get you like, yeah, sometimes to some extent, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. like, because because I I mean, anything that like learned from like the last like hundred years of psychology and and you know cognitive science, like it, yeah, I mean, there's 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 a lot going on under the hood that influences <laughs> human action, you know, that, that we're mm -hmm. not like consciously aware of it at, at, at any given moment. I mean, of course there is. Yeah. Well, anyway, we should, we should probably move on. Cause we're, we got this whole debate to get through and we're eight minutes in. <laughs> no, 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 I, I, I know. But, but you know, the thing I, I do just want to say, it's a really bad advertisement for praxeology that his stated motive at the beginning of the statement is that, he was trying to empirically study the, the effects of rent control. And sometimes he got the wrong answer from which he concluded not, huh, I guess maybe this isn't, you know, <laughs> as straightforward as I thought it was. Maybe rent control does not lead to these bad effects. But instead his conclusion was like, oh, clearly what I'm doing wrong here is trying to derive my economic conclusions from like, actually empirically studying what happens in the world you know now i see my mistake right i should just like be like the you know see no evil hear no evil monkeys <laughs> and like just just think really hard about praxeology and derive my about rent control from that Anyway. All right. There, let's, there let's... was something I was going to say, but um, oh no, this was it. But right before we move on, um, I wanted to uh, bring up. So he he quotes. He's like Hayek wouldn't agree with me, but Rothbard and von Mises would. And out of those three men, one is a Nobel Prize winner, <laughs> and it's the one that disagrees with him. So uh, Walter, I'm sorry, not a good example to use. <laughs> yeah, no, that is weird, right? Because like I mean, even aside from the Nobel Prize thing, it's like. Um, which of these three guys is someone who people who disagree with them are likely to like bring up in like a respectful way? Like, okay, you know, he, you know, has kind of an interesting argument about this. It's the one he, he's the one who disagrees with about this. Like, you know, <laughs> like 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 Hayek. You know, I mean, obviously, I I, I find you know I find all of his you know central conclusions abhorrent, right? And, and by the way, um, very, uh, very into uh, Pinochet and, and Salazar before that, uh, you know, very, very bad hombre. But, uh, uh, but again, like a much more serious thinker than, uh, I mean. Yeah, than yeah. Rothbard. And, like the only reason anyone knows who Ludwig von Mises is, is Rothbard. And Rothbard couldn't even get, like he did eventually get von Mises a job at NYU, but it was like a volunteer position where they paid him nothing. <laughs> and that was like with Rothbard trying his hardest to, to get him out of there. So yeah, I mean, you you if we're contrasting those three, you've got, um, you know, you got von Mises who's barely an economist, more of a pundit. Uh, that's what my friend who studies economics uh, and is a PhD in it mentioned on reading von Mises. And then you've got Rothbard, who is this kind purely of... purely a pundit. I mean, that's yeah. a, a, like just, just <laughs> unabashedly a pundit. Yeah. And yeah. then you have Hayek, who's, you know, we may disagree with him, but he's a real economist. You have been watching free public content from Give Them an Argument. To access every single episode of the show, the main show on uh, Monday nights, all of the streams, all of the uh, debate breakdowns, 
all of the patron exclusive post games on Monday nights, all of the patron exclusive bonus episodes every week, and much, much more. Go to patreon.com slash Ben Burgess. I cannot resist ending this with, don't be foolish. <laughs>